What's up, independent insurance agents? Are you finally fed up with the massive amounts of time, money, resources being allocated to customer service within your agency? Is this causing your agency growth and revenue to become stagnant or even decline? The answer to this frustration is Glovebox, the premier mobile and web self-servicing solution made by successful independent insurance agents just like us, specifically for independent insurance agencies. Guys, this is the only platform with direct carrier connections. Glovebox gives your clients the power to engage within their writing carriers and you, their agency, in a single, easy-to-use platform. Mention the Insurance Guys podcast and get 20% off of your monthly subscription for life, guys, for life. This isn't an intro deal. This is for life. Schedule your demo with Glovebox today. Thanks. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast powered by Glovebox. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and leader, insurance agency owner and insurance evangelist for iProtect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, she is a six foot three sophomore from Chattanooga, Tennessee, parade first team All-American rivals, five-star recruit. She is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Miss Tracy Cotton. How are you, Tracy? I'm doing very fine today, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I am proud to have you on board today. And guys, if you want to go back and listen and learn more about Tracy Cotton, she was on episode 113 of the Insurance Guys podcast one week before the outbreak of COVID-19 that shut down the U.S. And we're just proud to have you on the show today, Tracy. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I remember how awesome it was back in Las Vegas yep. to be at the, uh, the Keystone Conference yep. and get to be there with you and Bradley and get to meet your lovely wives. We were having such a fantastic time in Vegas and we were wondering, where is everybody? It was right. just a little bit a little yeah. bit calm, I thought, compared to what Vegas was. I was expecting it was my first time there, actually. And I was wondering why it just wasn't more like packed. I thought, well, the weather's good. And I didn't realize, of course, that all the big rollers from all of the Oriental areas were already shut out. Right. And that we were getting ready to get shut down ourselves. Right. The last trip that I took until just recently on a plane was, was that Vegas trip. And I just recently got to go again, but it, it was a much different experience back then. The only thing that I remember that looking back on it now was a little bit odd was we got, my wife and I got off our plane, our Delta flight, and we went to baggage claim and we got our baggage and we were headed out of baggage claim. And I remember there being a group, a pretty large group of Asian people on our flight and they walked past me and a group of about 20 or 25 of them, and they all had a mask on. And I remember saying something to Kim, like, why are they? And this was like after baggage claim, we we're all headed outside. And I, I asked her, I thought, that's strange that every one of them has a like a surgical mask on. Uh, but I didn't really think much about it then, didn't think about it during the conference. And then lo and behold, the next week, we all go back home. It was about a week, maybe, maybe two weeks, but it was a week or two after that, we all went home and all hell broke loose. Absolutely. Another fun filled fact that was, I thought was very interesting about that. So we get home from Vegas Keystone conference and simultaneously Bradley gets going to the doctor sick and my wife gets going to the doctor sick and looking back on it now, I don't know if they had COVID. They, they both say they didn't, but they had all those symptoms, you know, they were tired. They, <laughs> cough the the sore throat headache runny nose all that and they go to the doctor and at that time if you remember correctly doctors were still kind of making a joke about covid yep. i remember i went to see my doctor a week or two after we got back for for a, i think a general checkup and i was explaining that i'd had some sore throat and a little bit of cough and said something about covid and they said well you just need to stop drinking so many coronas or something something like that it was almost <laughs> Like a joke, you know, they're making a joke out of it. And then it wasn't long after that, there wasn't no joking going on. Mm -mm. That was crazy. So it was crazy. Tracy, we got a lot to talk about today. We got a lot to fill these guys in on about what's going on in our lives. 
Before we do, I think we need to get to the most important part of this podcast that I told you right before we came on, I would tell you about. You asked me the question, Scott, what are you going to dress up for as Halloween? Now, folks, you got to understand a few things here. Number one, I love Halloween. It's my favorite holiday, I think, probably my favorite holiday. And I love to dress up, as you know. So because we couldn't go out for COVID last year, I think my wife and I this year are dressing back up as Rip and Beth Dutton from the movie or the series Yellowstone this year. We we, oh, we, did, that. Yay. we did that last year, but we didn't get a we get to go to anywhere, get to go to a party, right. get to do anything. So it was just we took some pictures. I think that's gonna that's, that's gonna be pretty epic. I can picture it. Oh yeah. I went with Bradley, uh our wives went as well to uh the Young Tennessee Big Eye Conference up in uh Dollywood. Mm-hmm. I call it Dolly World. I saw that and, uh, one day uh, we were doing a panel session type thing and I showed up wearing my rip costume and everybody got a kick out of that. So yeah, it's pretty cool. When I posted those pictures on social media sites with me wearing the rip costume, I had people coming at me telling me that I was not the real rip. And I said, I'm a hundred percent with you. I'm not the real rip. It was like they were like having to tell people because when I get dressed up and all of it and the sunglasses and dye my my beard a little little darker, I, I'm telling you, I look pretty damn close to that guy. And I literally had people from around the world reaching out to me to let me know I wasn't ripped. And I was well, like, hundred percent, you're right. That is too funny that, that they had to point that out. I will. I'm going to throw the question back on you. What are you dressing up for as Halloween this year? The clock's up right now. I actually got the makeup and haven't practiced yet, but I really want to be Sally from Nightmare Before Christmas because Ooh. I'm a huge, huge Jack Skellington fan. Gotcha. Uh, but, and I really want to do the whole makeup and everything. However, I also have a friend that was like, well, you know, the easy thing would be, you know, I can dress up like a doctor and you can dress up like a nurse from the Blink-182 co- cover. Ooh. What's this? It's just a lot. It's a yeah, lot. That's right. that's a lot for me. So I don't know. I'm almost more comfortable in the idea of wearing makeup and rags than a red brassiere and the blue gloves. I don't know. It's a toss up. So all right, we'll see. secret time here. Secret time. Nobody's going to hear this except you and I. <laughs> and two hundred fifty thousand insurance agents. Yeah, those. Two. I think the most jealous that I ever get of somebody in my life is when I go to a really big, good Halloween party where like there's hundreds of people there and people spend the time, energy, effort, and money to do like the group costumes like Kiss and they look just like them. Like they've got the, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of dollars spent, like the boots and the, the makeup and everybody looks like a member of that particular and some of these Halloween parties that I used to go to when I lived in Birmingham, they would have like a thousand dollar cash prize for the number one, you know, the, the, the number one costume in the costume contest. So people would like legit get dressed up Edward scissors hands and the guys, yep. got the, the, you know, the real looks like him. And I just, I've always been envious of those people that spend the time of the time, energy effort to make a costume that looks exactly like the real thing. I agree with you there. So we'll (laughs) see. We'll see. So let's help these insurance agents out today. You and I have a lot in common. And as I told you, our mission on this podcast is to help these agents any way we can. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today was something that you and I both have experienced in our lifetime. And that is packing up the wagon, putting it all in a U-Haul, driving to another city and that you don't know a soul at least for me i didn't know a soul when i got to huntsville alabama close to it and i shouldn't say that maybe i knew one i really don't think i knew anybody from i knew people from around huntsville but i don't think i knew anybody from huntsville and starting an insurance career and you know one thing i'm going to say to all these agents out there today and this is a Justin Miller saying that I'm stealing from him right now, but there's a ditch on both sides of that road, right? Yep. 
the older I get, I'm 49 years old, and the longer I'm in the industry, the more I'm not so sure that it's not easier to do that than it is harder to do that. Let me explain. I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm saying right now. So when you grow up in a small town and, and you've lived there your whole life, or, or maybe even just a medium-sized town, 25, 50,000 people, you know, there's a lot of positives between being there and being an agent. You know a lot of people. There's a lot of people you can call on. But the advantage that you have moving somewhere and starting your insurance career is nobody knows you. You have no baggage. There's none of the rumors of or things that went on in a previous life that you might have to deal with. And I think in some ways, it might actually be easier to do that than to be in your town that you grew up with and selling insurance. Because one thing I've noticed about people over the years, been doing this a long time, is the hardest people to sell are your friends and family. And when you're in a small town, First of all, you get your feelings hurt when your buddy that you grew up with and went to church with doesn't buy insurance from you, right? You get your feelings hurt there. Then your parents and your friends want to see if you're going to make it in the industry before they put their business with you. I, I've noticed one other thing, too, about family members and, and close friends. A lot of them don't want you to know about their business. And in right. insurance, you know, you have to ask certain questions and you have to talk about you're selling commercial insurance. You have to talk about their business and what they make every year and, you know, gross revenue and, and you know, uh, payroll and all that type of thing. And I think sometimes people in general would rather almost deal with a stranger. Do you agree or am I just completely losing my mind right now? No, I think you're, you're right on target with that, that there's, I mean, it's some of those hard questions and, and yeah. even for the, the people you're talking to uh, that, you know, that you've known and loved, maybe that's just a little bit too personal. Right. I tell you, I tell you another, I tell you another product that that can get really weird with is when you get you a family member on the phone, want to buy some life insurance. <laughs> and Okay. Let's go. Th what medications are you taking? You know, that kind of stuff. And they're like, well, I don't want to talk about that. You know, they it can get weird. It can get weird. And you don't have those limitations when you go to a new city. Nobody knows who you are. No, you know, it's a fresh start. It's a, I heard somebody say something the other day that really caught my attention. It was on a podcast, and I don't remember who said it, but it really caught my attention. Here's what they said, guys. They said, people move to Los Angeles to be found. People move to New York after they've made it. And they're, they're known people that are known move to New York. People move to Miami who are running from something. <laughs> so people, people move to Los Angeles to be found. They move to New York because they've made it and they are somebody and they move to Miami beach to run from something. And I thought, damn, that, I know that's generalizing in a lot of ways, but there's something to that when it comes to a lot of folks. You know, uh, I think they're all moving from California to Chattanooga. So maybe they are running for something and, and Huntsville and Huntsville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's been an interesting dynamic since COVID started is I literally uh, if I put while I'm speaking to you, if I put my my home and 30 acres, my, my farm on Facebook for sale, I would have it sold by the time we got off this podcast mm -hmm. and could probably ask whatever I wanted for it. Yeah. And then they'll be fighting for it. Oh, yeah, there'd be four or five of them fighting for it. That's yep. exactly right. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, but I'm 20 minutes from downtown Huntsville. And so you have not only people here that want to get out and go out in the country, but then you've got all these people coming in from California and Oregon and all these other places that are wanting to, the, the big cities that want to come in and have some land. And it's just amazing right now. What has been the biggest challenge for you uprooting yourself and moving to Chattanooga and starting your new insurance career there? You know, I don't know that I considered it a challenge. I just considered it to be like a lot of fun. One of the things which that, is, which is, by the way, is the way to look at that. And it's, it's funny because I, I work the office that I work out of in Chattanooga, it's myself and uh, five producers 
one that I work directly with and the other four, you know, just also happen to have offices there. And the running joke is, is almost every Friday, they're going to ask, so what is it you're doing this weekend, Tracy? Because they know it's something that they probably haven't even done in Chattanooga yet. Yeah. It's a restaurant they haven't been to. It's an activity they haven't uh, attempted. It's a trail they didn't even know about. And that's been the fun part is just getting out and really trying to get to know the town and realizing, I think for me, it was, it's been pretty fantastic to realize how small a big town it was. Mm -hmm. And that's, there's a lot of history to it and people know each other and that the connections are there and I'm having a great time with that in itself. There's, there's definitely, I'm constantly coming back to the office going, Hey, does, does anybody know about so-and-so? And I'm trying to bring leads back. That's one of the things that I, I do like to do is, is kind of be a little bit of business development in my multifaceted role. But that's one of the things that I'm constantly realizing is that it's, it's all very much tied together. It's a very, it's, it's like a small town that just happens to be a little bit bigger. I, I've got a question for you. And then I want to come back to the business development role that you just talked about for a second. But here's my question. You're one of the only people in my life that I look at with some level of envy that seems to have an acute understanding at how finite this life of ours is. And you probably more than anybody else I know seem to want to squeeze every bit of life out of it in terms of experiencing new things, trying new things. Guys, if you don't know, and you can go back and listen to episode 113. So when Tracy Cotton, first person I've ever heard of doing this, when she turned, I believe it was, was it 45 or 50? What? 50. 50. When you turned 50, you wrote down one thing you were going to do that you've never tried before. Oh, was it, was it for each day? Was it for each week of the year? Or what? I can't remember now what it was. I ended up with 50 for 50, 50, 50 for 50. Okay. 50 for 50. And I believe just about, if not all of these things were things that you had never tried, tried some, you thought you couldn't do things like skydiving, getting up at open mic at a comedy club. You seem to want to suck the marrow out of life. You know, uh, Robin Williams, like the dead poets society talked about sucking the marrow out of life. What happened to you? What experience or tragedy, or has this just been a personality thing that you just always had this adventurous personality that, that causes you to be that like that? I think I've always had a little bit of FOMO. I, I have that definite fear of missing out on some, I hear about something that's going on and I, if I'm not, I'm not a part of it, I really want to be a part of it. It's like, I was totally jealous that I didn't get to come because I'm no longer a young agent. So I couldn't come up to, to Dolly World and and hang out with y'all that that particular weekend you were in town, near town at least. But literally speaking, it really goes back to 2018 when I was sitting there looking at my planner, and I've always been a planner, and I do try to stay active and do things. And there was always that feeling of ever since I was you know young, always liking to stay active and have lots of things on the calendar. But once I started that 50 for 50, and you get over that fear of I'm not going to be good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. This is really scary. And you start doing these things and then you do more things and you keep doing things. And and then that fear goes away and then it becomes more of an excitement. And what I realized in that year was that there was almost nothing that that was out there that I was capable and I wasn't capable of at least trying. Now, mind you, I, I think that I know that Woody Brown and I, his, his contribution to my 50 for 50 was, the triathlon. And I said, okay, I don't know that I can do an Ironman. You know, I'm not Sydney Rowe. Don't think I can do an Ironman, but could I do a sprint triathlon? Would that count towards the 50 for 50? And he said, absolutely. So that's what I did. Right. So sometimes it's finding, you know, the, the one thing that you could do that, you know, along those same lines, you want to try something, try it, try it on the scale that you are most capable of doing, but then just keep trying there's things that I've gone back and I've now been paddle boarding five times. It wasn't until the fourth time that I actually fell in. That was most recently in Nickajack Lake recently. Let, let, let me stop you right there. I have a question. I have two questions for you. 
you said that you're a planner. So if you're a planner, does that mean that you have an adventurous spirit, but you're not spontaneous? Meaning, <laughs> you, you see where I'm going with this? Like some people are spontaneous. Some people, their personality type, you know, somebody walks in here and goes, hey, uh, let's go to Atlanta tomorrow night and go to the Braves game. And some people be like, okay, let's go, let's go. Now, granted, that spontaneity probably gets – contained if you have family kids responsibilities when you're not you know married four or five kids you can't you can be a little more spontaneous but are you spontaneous and adventurous or just adventurous i'm, I'm actually both but the, the planner part of me was the the fact that i knew that if i did not set certain i didn't go ahead and start putting things on the calendar they weren't going to happen it was going to be too much for me to try to get done in a small amount of time. I mean, 50 things in a year's time. And a lot of them were outdoor things. I couldn't even get started on some of them until later in the spring and summer. It was crazy. Then I was trying to figure out how I was going to get to the ocean in order to surf. I don't live near the ocean. I, right. I was living in Western North Carolina at the time. I live now in Chattanooga. I, you know, I'm, I'm as far inland as you can go practically. And, and to be just in the South. And I had to plan it. I had to, to get it on the calendar in order to make it happen. But there were things that fell apart along the lines on that. There was several things that fell apart that year that then I had to try to find a substitute or I had to kind of take like opportunities that came up. When my Art Loeb trail, that particular backpacking trip fell through on the very first day, I, I only made it through the first 24 hours and I had to call a friend. I literally had to phone a friend mm. and get off the trail because I was so miserable and was so ill-prepared. And that was one of my 50 for 50. I attempted but I had the rest of that weekend luckily available because I got a tweet. It wasn't towards me. It was just a tweet that I happened to see from a bartender that used to be on Bar Rescue. And he was going to be coming through Asheville and was just wondering if anybody was around that he knew off of Twitter. And I was like, hello, hello. <laughs> I'm here. Please and me. we connected and he said, you know, let me do a let me do a cocktail class for you. And I said, sure. So next thing I know, like we're all over Asheville, like doing a bar crawl. And, you know, I'm with somebody who's literally teaching me about, you know, mixology along the way. And I never would have had an opportunity if I hadn't just dropped everything, literally. Of course, that weekend was supposed to have been already scheduled and it didn't happen. So I had the weekend to be empty anyway, and it worked out perfectly. But I was willing to just go with it. Total stranger. And we're just piling up in the vehicle and just going and having a great time. And it was, it was, you know, fantastic. And, you know, now Mezcal's my friend. So let me ask this question. Are you somebody that if you're at home, let's say two or three weekends in a row, does that ever happen? Does that ever happen? If I was oh, your, if I was your next door neighbor in the house that you live in now in Chattanooga, would I ever see you on the weekends or is it cars, cars loaded up going somewhere every single weekend? I, I like to be gone a lot, but one of the things that I specifically did when I chose where I live now is I wanted to create a space to have people be able to come and visit me so that I wouldn't have to be gone all the time. And it would be, sometimes there'll be weekends and there has been this summer. It's been fantastic just to have people having left, you know, an area that I really loved and a lot of friends and having people all over the United States now that are my friends through insurance and through the agriculture industry, I now have space to bring people in and then I can show them an adventure by them coming here and getting to experience Chattanooga with me. That's great. That's fantastic. Okay. I can move off that now. I just, I, <laughs> I find that wildly interesting. I, I think I'm a little bit of a hybrid of all of everything we just talked about. I can stay home for two, three, four weekends. My wife is very spontaneous uh, to some degree and very, uh, I don't want to say adventurous, but she gets, she gets restless when she's home too long for three, four, five weeks. There will come a time after three or four or five weeks of being at home and not going anywhere on the weekends and kind of falling into a routine where she'll, she'll come to me and be like, hey, we, we got to get out of here. I got to go do something. So that's why I'm wildly interested in people. I know some people who are homebodies, they stay home every weekend, they do their thing at home. I know some people, couples that every single weekend they're gone doing something every weekend. And then there's some people just in the middle. And I think I probably fall somewhere in the middle. But I, I, you are one of the only people in my, I don't think you understand 
that you're not normal. I don't think most people, I think the vast majority of people would never, if I, if I walked out here on the street and I just start stopping somebody, I said, Hey, I want you, it's your birthday to do 50 for 50, where you get up, get up at a comedy club, do a routine. They would just be like, you've lost your damn mind. There's no way. Scott, I need you to skydive. I need you to ski. I need you to surf. I need you to, most people just, they just don't have that in them. I think you're a rare breed that can suck the marrow out of life, if you will. Well, and I think the thing that is translated into insurance, and that's one of the things that I, I do find absolutely beautiful about what it is that we do, is that whereas somebody, you know, I know that I probably just have one of those personalities where I, I won't say that I get bored easily, but I am very prone to look for the next thing. I'm looking for other opportunities where I can grow, what I can learn. Rest, what I can would, do. You, would you use the word restless? And there's some, maybe it is a restlessness, yeah. uh, but at the very least it's, it's really that wanting, just always wanting to, to like see what's, you know, on the next horizon. I've stayed in insurance uh, for a long, long time now. I mean, like a really long time now it's, it's over 25 years. And the way that I've been able to do that is because I just haven't done the same thing. I, I'll, and I've, I did different things when I worked for Morrow Insurance Agency. I started out in personal lines and then I went to commercial lines and then I went from being a, an account executive to a producer. I went from working on our main office to working on our Marion office, kind of a, a middle-sized town to a, to a very small town and, and then making my own niche. And then when I came to Chattanooga, I knew that I had opportunity to, you know, I was looking for something I, what can I offer somebody else? What can I offer an agency? What What's out there? And it's tough because there's a lot of great positions out there right now. I mean, I don't know if anybody's you know looking for a job in insurance, but if you're not in insurance or you know somebody who's just looking for a job in insurance, I, y'all just look on LinkedIn. It is absolutely so many opportunities out there. But for me, I knew that I had to really pick the one that I'm at an age now where I, I know what I can do and what I can't do. Right. And there's certain things I'm really good at and there's certain things that I'm mediocre at. And I had to pick and I had to kind of shift and I had to let go of some things that I had built. And that's difficult, but it was to gain something that I felt was really the next thing going for me. And it was a really exciting opportunity to do something that hadn't been done before. Tell me what you're mediocre at. <laughs> I, I would love to know. Now, what you just described to our audience is, and I've, I've always known this about you, is you are, you are what we call in baseball a utility player. Uh, I have one of those in my agency. She can do it all. You know, I call, I call that kind of a unicorn. She can do service work. She can sell. She, you know, a lot of different things. What people love to hear what we're mediocre at. I'll be happy to tell people what I'm mediocre at because I'm not good at about 98% of things I do. But what are, what are you, medi- what do you feel like you're mediocre at? I am a mediocre at mundane, repetitive tasks in general. And my greatest admiration has always been for those account executives and for that matter, even, even those folks that, you know, kind of go behind us, even on the accounting side that have to go behind and check commissions and, and do all that, that paperwork that's involved with it. And, you know, when I'm working with a client that's got 90 vigils, it's painful to, to check the numbers after the first 15, to, to input, to do those kinds of detail oriented things that just to me, after a little bit, becomes so tedious that I'm ready just to, you know, to go set my eyebrows on fire. And that's what I, I know that I can do. I mean, I, I, there's literally some of the little things that I do for some of the clients that we have now, you know, I work on some of their things on some of the audits and I go through and I have to really like break down the different States and I'm looking at net rates and I get in the weeds and I'm doing spreadsheets and it's for a day. Correct. And that's what's cool because I'll do that for a day, but then tomorrow I might be doing something entirely different. And that right. makes me happy because it's not the only thing I do. If so, I had to do that, that would be mediocre of, of me, I think. So I'm an agency owner. I have people who are account executives. And what you just said earlier is something that scares me a little bit. The mundane sameness for some people doing the same things every day, even though it might be with a different client 
and it might be a little bit different, but it's still kind of the same thing. How do I, as an agency owner, and I've got some ideas about this myself, but how do I shake things up with them every now and then so that they don't feel like it's Groundhog Day every day? Or can, would, or can, or can you? There's And there's definitely some people that I would dare say are, are not really going to want you to shake up anything. Right. I don't know if you said, hey, you know, I really think it would be great if you looked into another designation. You would be fantastic. You know, I, I think you could, you know, you could go from being a CISR to a CISR elite. And they'd be like, you know, I got through the fat, the first few classes. I'm done. That's not my thing. Mm-hmm. I just keep on doing it. And and for those folks, I mean, just really making it a great work environment where they feel appreciated, that appreciation and and giving them that you know, add a girl, add a boy on a regular basis to me makes a huge difference in what they're going to feel good about on a daily basis. Sometimes it's just kind of like smoothing the path for them because they really don't like, you know, if you're a producer, don't go dump everything, you know, right before it's due on a, on an account exec, because you're going to get pushback and probably with good reason, they weren't prepared for you to come decide, oh, I forgot to tell you, I've got all this stuff going on and it needs to be submitted yesterday, you know, give them a little bit of time, give them that space that they need, because that might make them much more comfortable than for me. You know, I, you know, I, I kind of thrive on a little bit of uh, adrenaline and I don't mind that so much, but somebody else that's really a stressor. Yeah. A couple of things that I've, I've tried to do in our agency. So Brittany Van Winkle is our, one of our commercial account managers that works out here out of our Huntsville office. But she lives halfway between here and Athens. So it's kind of same distance. And one of her best friends is actually our claims manager uh, in our Athens office. So I've started letting Brittany work three days a week here with me in this office beside me. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, I let her work out of Athens so that she and Harley can go to lunch and hang out, visit, probably don't get quite as much work done because they're talking and whatever, but just trying to break up that monot, that mundane, same thing every single day, drive to work, get out, you know, work till five, go home, trying to break some of that up. Chris Paradiso does a great job of that. Moves people around offices, changes up offices every six months to a year. So if you're sitting here this month, six months from now, you might be sitting in there. I think he even switches up roles. So personal lines account manager may be doing commercial. Commercial may do personal lines for a while to just try to break up that monotony so you don't feel like it's Groundhog Day every day. And that's really, I think that that's one of the things that I learned uh, back in the day when I was doing consulting. And uh, Kelly Donahue Piro will tell you the same thing. You may not realize that somebody is stagnated until they have an opportunity to maybe have to do something different. Like they're forced to have to do something different one day and they just absolutely like show up in a way that you weren't expecting them to, right. you know, somebody was out from the person, you know, the commercialized department, somebody had to talk to somebody and they just like, wow, I, maybe I'm interested in learning more about that. Right. If you don't have people in the right seats on the bus, then, you know, we're all in for a pretty poor ride overall. And there's some right. people that I know that, they're just going to be happy as clams not to be, you know, you just keep that, keep yeah. that just calm water for them and other ones that really want to have. And I think that everybody in, in general wants to, to just have a great, a great working environment and somebody that really, you know, they make, they feel appreciated. Here's another area. I think you and I both, we shine in. Okay. Business development. You mentioned it earlier. You're getting out, you're slinging business cards. You're talking to people. That's something that I felt like I do a fairly decent job of, sometimes better than others. Always got business cards in my wallet. I have this new thing. You can't really see it. It's on my wrist called Popple, P-O-P-L. Mixed results with that, but I took it, I put it on my wrist. It's got all of my contact information, just like a business card, but even more like social media accounts, all that is on this. And I just touch it to the back of your phone and it transmits my data into your phone. How cool is that? Yeah. So I took that to the big eye West Virginia conference and you would have thought I I was showing people fire for the first time. They were like, Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that is the, now here's the downside to it. I took it to a conference that I was attended last weekend in Dallas, Texas, 
and it wasn't working great. Like, you know, you're supposed to just be able to touch it to the back of the phone and it will transmit your data into their phone. You, they can see where it says popple and then they click that and it says save contact. But for some reason, last weekend, I was putting it on people's phones and it just wasn't working very well. So I'm going to have to figure that out. But what are your thoughts on slinging business cards and going out in a new community like Chattanooga and just introducing yourself to the world? For me, it's a mix. I know that getting out and now that we're really able to, I'm supported the agency that I work for now, Star Matthews. They've been great to say, oh, you want to go to the... uh, over in Ringgold, just the first county you get into in Northern Georgia, we've got an office and the Catoosa County, that Chamber of Commerce is one that we insure. And it's one that I know all, it's a completely female run Chamber of Commerce, which makes it kind of fun. (laughs) And they do a ladies luncheon every quarter. And I've attended almost all of them since I've been working there. Nobody else in the agency really wants to go. It's a ladies only. And so I'm going to be able to get in and actually talk to people that the rest of the quote unquote guys in the office aren't going to. And that's been good. It's it's building relationships. It's a PR experience. And it definitely has uh, given us some new opportunities just for me able to come back and go, hey, you know, here's somebody that, you know, we need, we need to talk to. And I, I find that to be still to be a great way to do it. But Scott, you and I both know that one of the things that I've always enjoyed and I've always loved is I still really enjoy getting to know people through social media. And one of the things that's been a unique experience in Chattanooga was getting to know new people. And that's that's actually like kind of the new thing that I've I've started recognizing that if I started following people who, you know, did certain kinds of things that, you know, then it's, you know, highlighting, you know, finding what they're doing in their business and paying attention and interacting with them that it it works that way as well. And that's been something kind of fun and interesting to to get to know some some more people that way, because it's kind of a backdoor. That's that way of sometimes getting to know somebody that you wouldn't be able to on that same level uh, otherwise. And that's been kind of fun too. You know, it's funny you bring that up. I was listening to Gary Vaynerchuk yesterday. I I haven't listened to him in probably six months, but he was doing a, uh, a new little uh, podcast he does on Fridays with entrepreneurs. And he was talking about the fact that Apple is really locking down their privacy and they're the people who use Apple's products locking down, you know, privacy on those iPhones and iPads and the, the apps that you use. And he was saying that, you know, Facebook is enthralled in all this stuff right now and that they are really uh, looks like going to lock down the ability for businesses like insurance agents to do kind of what we could do a year or two ago with Facebook advertising and lookalike groups. And, you know, uh, they were, they were, I hate to say it, but they were almost like circumventing privacy to allow, if you're willing to pay to run ads, to reach the target audiences that you wanted to pay, uh, to pay, to get to. And he was saying, he said, you know, I hate to say this, but he said, this has never changed. The way to get to people through social media is number one, put out great content. And number two, respond to somebody, you know, says something on your social media page or like something, talk to them you know, talk back to them. He said, you know, that that's unfortunately because of the safety concerns that are starting to crop up with privacy issues that, that what was working for him five, six, seven years ago, where he would respond to every comment on Twitter and every comment on Instagram and all that, that's going to be one of the ways that you can reach out to people, kind of what you were just talking about. Literally speaking, I know that what we're also probably going to see the decline of at some point, I mean, it's already kind of peaked is there was also like this rush for some certain industries to get out there and try to use influencers, right? people who were really trending on Instagram and they would start promoting a product on their Instagram page and things like that. And I I just think people saw through that and it was going to be, it was only going to be so much of that that was going to really work. I recognize that there's still people who are influenced by that. And there's, and it's like anything else. It's like sponsorship. You know, if I'm, if I'm competitively shooting 
And, you know, and some, you know, particular gun manufacturer wants to, you know, put their name on the back of my shirt. I'm all about putting the name on the back of my shirt and somebody else may or may not buy because of that. But what I I think I recognize is, especially in life we live now, is people pay more attention to what's going on in the community because that's, the, you know, that's, that's the real life. That's the real life. Mm-hmm. And if there's things going on in their community that you can somehow be a part of, I recently did, and you know, this kind of goes right in my wheelhouse, is I recently did a Nuga bucket list. And a what? A Nuga bucket list. Okay. Chattanooga, Nuga, I got it. So Nuga Now, which is an online newsletter that I get in my email uh, five days a week, they put up a list of things that the readers said were the best things to do in Chattanooga. And it was a list of 10 things. And they decided to run a contest that the first person who could take a photo and verify that they had done all 10 things, the first three people would be entered to win like some little goodies, like a, it was a, a hat and a mug. And I can't remember something else. And I decided, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. That would get me a, a chance to get to know some things in the area. and. So I ran out and did it all a week and and I documented all of it with a hashtag and I, and I tagged them in it and I tagged any place else I went and put the pictures up. And that was kind of fun because now the folks at Nougat Today know who I am and some other people who are in the community noticed. And those are, it just became some conversations and that was kind of fun. Like, you know, I, I now, I now I'm connected to one of the announcers for the lookouts uh, and I, because lookouts have now become near and dear to my heart. I never even liked baseball before yeah. fact. And now I've been to multiple games for the lookouts. One, the first game was because it was on the list of things to do, either go to a lookouts game, the red wolves, which is the soccer. I think, I don't know. There was other ones I could have chosen from, but I chose lookouts and that was, and so now I regularly chat with one of the announcers that, that works for the lookouts because of being connected. Anyway, it's, it's silly and it's fun. And I just think that if you know what it is that you're looking for and you can be in those conversations, it's just like when we talked about it back in Vegas about the farms, Twitter was the best thing that I ever found to learn about the farming industry because I started paying attention to hashtag ag Twitter. And that was the water cooler that I needed to sit beside. And to this day, it's still, you know, it's still a fun thing for me, even though that's not what I'm doing anymore. Well, social media is still the number one place in my opinion, that you can become the insurance guy or girl in your community. And I think the, even in the smaller your community is, especially if you're putting out great content, funny content stuff, but my wife, my God, if I owned a insurance agency in Arab Alabama, number one, she taught second grade for 14 years. And number two, it seems like everybody in Arab Alabama follows my wife on social media and half of them don't ever say anything. They never comment. They never like, but we go to Arab, uh, anytime we go up there, somebody will always stop us and say, Oh my gosh, I saw that you posted your mini horse on Facebook the other day. And they want to sit there and talk about it. And it's just amazing to me, the reach, if you're putting out great content, the reach that you have in your area, it's just amazing. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. So next thing I wanted to bring up today, and this is something I need all the, these insurance agents to listen to. You have started a new position, and I, I am wildly interested in this, and I think other agents need to hear this, as far as what your title is, which I'm going to go ahead and break the code on that. She is the executive client manager for this insurance agency. Talk to these agents about what you're doing, and like I said, wildly interested in this because I think there's room in our agency to have somebody like this come in, but it's going to have to be somebody like you. That's a five tool player, very experienced. Talk more about it. I I want you to tell our audience about this. So when I answered the ad, I knew that what they were looking for was literally everything I'd ever done in insurance. I mean, if I looked at it and I really was reading the ad properly, I was like, wow, that sounds like everything I've ever done. It's you know, they're, they're looking for somebody that's, that's definitely going to be able to talk directly with the clients on higher level type of, of interactions than just, I need an ID card. It was somebody that was willing to be able to dig deep and could possibly develop the actual 
client further uh, through renewal reviews and picking out additional coverages to present, spending time with that process, and, and also really kind of run interference between the account executives and this producer. What I have that, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm working with is I have a very high level producer that he has spent you know, the better part of a decade working in an agency that's a hundred year old agency that he is one of the Matthews of Star Matthews. And you know, it was a family owned and grown business out of Calhoun, Georgia. But his pride in what he does and his knowledge of insurance, having grown up with it, with a dad that was obviously in it, and then his brother, and then following his brother's footsteps, having worked out in the insurance world outside of the agency first, he actually worked um, outside the agency for a few years, came in, and he's just fantastic at developing relationships. He is is so good at, at making things super simple and is so personable. He can talk to anybody from, you know, from, you know, an 80 year old woman uh, to, you know, to a high powered executive um, or the 80 year old woman that used to be the high powered executive, as well as, as just, he has that gift of, of making people feel good about whatever it is they do. And with that, he's built this incredible book of business. It's the largest in the agency and it continues to knock everybody else's numbers. And yet, he had gotten to the place where he was the it guy, you know, he's it, he's the guy for them. He's their guy. And then they also have an account executive who handles their ID cards, their their certificates of insurance, who might be able to answer a billing question and so forth. But if they call them, they're going to say, well, maybe I'm Barton on that. And that's what they would do. So they knew that they had two options. They either needed to get a hold of Barton or they needed to get a hold of their account exec who still might need to talk to Barton. And that, little circle of death, if you will, is where I see a lot of agencies running into when they get somebody that they've pushed and pushed to just produce, you know, out the door. And even though they have really, in some cases, great account execs, there's still this in between. No man's land. No man's land. I think that it exists almost everywhere. There's definitely some different levels now where I see that there's account executives that can grow beyond where they're at. Correct. But that's not always a possibility. And that's not what he was finding. And he decided instead, let me make up this position where it's kind of like everything I do when I'm, you know, but for somebody to do when I'm not around. And, well, and, and, and how many times do you hear, especially a great commercial producer, that's, that's really who this person is that you're describing that their biggest pain point is I sold that person the policy and I can set all the expectations you want, but when they really need something, who are they going to call? Right. They're going to, they're going to call that person, right? They're, they're, you're, you're the one that sold me the policy. I'm yep. having a problem. I need to speak to you. And the beauty and what y'all were able to do was you shorten that distance and gave your your guy or girl, you, you gave them that opportunity to continue to go out and kill new business without being bogged down with as many. I know there's probably still people that you deal with that say, I don't care who you are, how long you've been doing it. I won't speak to him, but you gave him that opportunity now to go out and kind of take some of that off his shoulders to allow him to continue to move forward and build and grow and sell insurance and not have as many of these these phone calls that range from emergency down to something that's more important than just checking on a billing account, but I still want to talk to him about it. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And that's exactly the, what you are. Yeah. And it's, it's those friction points that, that we just, we recognize that we're either a preventing him from getting out and, and, you know, and you know, doing what he does best, which is sell more Or B, it was really where the clients were not getting the value added attention that they wanted. Right. I mean, when we're, when we're selling insurance nowadays, I mean, really, I mean, the policies end up being pretty similar. You know, what we can do for them is going to be fairly similar. I mean, anybody, you know, with a, anybody with a pulse can, can put out a a certificate of insurance. There's, there's a lot of other things that go along with that, that, those are conversations that need to be had on a regular basis. It's that point in between the renewal mm-hmm. and, and, and actually the beginning of the policy. 
and I've got the opportunity that I can actually spend time uh, and effort in other points of contact uh, for them and keeping the top of mind there, as well as really delving into those kinds of questions. You know, when it can be, come to a, a difficult audit, when it comes to to a difficult claim situation, and we've got a great claims department and, and they do a great job, but then there's sometimes there just needs to be somebody to kind of like go back and forth between. Sure. And literally, I mean, if my middle name needed to be changed, it needed to be changed to follow up. Right. Because that's what I feel like I do every day is I'm continually following up on whatever it is that's in progress. And, you know, it's, it's running interference. He used to call me his quarterback. And I said, no, that was, that was who he was. But uh, that was, that was the joke there for a little while. And, but literally my favorite word, and I already told you this is I like to think of myself as a concierge. Right. When you go I, I to, love that. I love that so much. You know, when you when you go someplace and you want to be really taken good care of, you're going to turn to that concierge for anything. You know, they're going to make sure that you know you've got the best tickets, that you've got the best, you know, the best experience wherever you go, and they're going to know it. And and that's the thing that you know I just brought the experience, and I brought also you know the ability to to make those kind of connections. I think to the job. And sometimes it is, I mean, it's a different job every day. Like I said, sometimes I'm spending time pouring over spreadsheets and other times I'm, you know, I'm writing new business for their extra LLC. You know, they ended up deciding to open up another LLC and they just need a, you know, a builder's risk. You don't have time for that. We also don't want to turn it over to the small business department because this is still completely tied to his current clients. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of keeps things close to the vest and people feel really taken care of. And that's what I am loving about it. Well, here's the, we've talked about this position in my agency and the problem most agents are going to run into is it is very difficult to find somebody with your energy, enthusiasm, your professionalism, your experience, your critical thinking skills, the position that you're in is not a $10 an hour position. It's not, let's go hire somebody from Chick-fil-A and let them be in this position because they're going to, it's going to eat them alive. You know, you, you have to have a competence level high enough and you have to have critical thinking skills, enthusiasm, tonality. When you talk to people on the phone, because here's what happens. If you don't hire a Tracy cotton in this position, then you're basically wasting your money because once they do talk to that person that's not Tracy Cotton, who doesn't have the level of experience, that doesn't have the critical thinking skills, that doesn't have the the tonality in her voice and the way she speaks to people and the the, the caring, then all that person on the other end of the phone is going to say is, I don't, I, I don't want to talk to you. Can I talk to the person that sold me this policy? That's, that's what's going to happen, right? So that is a That is a unicorn position that I think a lot of agencies would love to have somebody, but it's got to be the right person. And it's got to be somebody that you're, you've got to be willing to pay that person for their level of experience, years in service, their ability to be a great concierge. Am I crazy or am I crazy? You're not crazy, Scott. And I think that I want to put this out here and this is, you know, this is, you know, me being controversial every once in a while. And, and I would say that this is really where it becomes important to recognize that there is some benefit to finding somebody who has actually been around the block. Yep. And we, we recognize, you know, that in this insurance industry, there's a lot of gray hair and I've got a good streak of it going. That's not blonde anymore. That's gray. But with that came a lot of, time spent in the trenches doing everything from marketing to customer service to into to into claims personal lines commercial lines and that's something that you know I I think that it just has to be recognized that you're gonna you're gonna need somebody that's gonna have enough experience and sometimes it's also it, it really is you're gonna have to find somebody that just has been around long enough that they have the confidence. And that's the other thing that comes with experience is is somebody who's confident enough to say, you know what, Barton's not around. I'm going to make this decision because it's the right decision to make and, and, you know, and and let the chips fall where they may. And that's, that's not an easy thing to do, but in a year's time, I've, you know, I've found that it's become just a a really 
fantastic experience for me to be part of a team that has gone from not knowing me from Adam, because none of them ever paid attention to Agency Nation or anything. They'd never seen any of my blog posts. They They didn't know what a big deal you were. They didn't know I was a big deal. So (laughs) they had no idea. And, And to be able to gain their trust, to know that if he's not there when he's on a you know, a week's vacation very deservedly, or if he has to be out of the office because of of working on uh, larger accounts and spending time traveling on the road, that they can count on me. And that's that's what, you know, I realized that that I had, you know, I couldn't just be something on paper. I had to be something to show them. I, I had to earn their trust. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, the two hardest positions to hire for in an insurance agency would be your position, executive client manager or concierge, concierge service for maybe a large commercial producer that was writing larger accounts, but needed that liaison between himself and just the account managers that are, that are back in the office. And the second person that's the hardest to, to hire is someone to be your renewal specialist, a little bit of the same role. But let me tell you something, that is a special, special person that can call potentially on some other producer's client and give them the bad news, good news scenario. Hey, your policy went up, but great news. Well, I was able to work with another carrier. We got it down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make it easy for you, blah, 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 blah. Those are unicorn positions that you cannot hire somebody off the street that doesn't know shit from shampoo about insurance, put them in that role because they are going to fail miserably, miserably, because in both of those positions, it's like a dog smelling fear. You know, Mm -hmm. the first first time your inexperienced renewal uh, manager calls somebody and starts yabba-dabba-dooing and, uh, 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 well, I don't know. What are they going to do? They're going to go shop. Okay. Thanks. Well, appreciate you calling me. Uh, I'll be back in touch. And then they hang up and call some other agency, State Farm, whoever. In my opinion, those are people who have to get paid well. Hope you are, because that's a that's a big. I mean, the first word of your job title is executive. Executive to me is someone who's experienced, who's professional, knowledgeable, knows their stuff. You know, can can get it done. I hope they know what they've got over there, because that's that's a that's a unicorn position. I like to think so. And, you know, the, the idea though, I mean, I've learned a lot in the years that I've been in insurance. And I think that it's, it's possible to train somebody to, to get up to speed on certain things, but, you know, we may not be able to take somebody in house and do it again. It may be that we'll end up having to hire out for the next position that'll be doing the same thing that I'm doing for one of the other producers. And, and so we're really, really trying to make sure we get it right this time. And we're really trying to figure out what's possible and what doesn't really work. And there's been a few things that haven't. And, you know, and there's, that's the wonderful thing is seeing, you know, seeing sometimes things don't work and, and then you move on, but you learn from it. And that's been a, it's been a good process. We, wow. we literally, we get together, uh, we get together once a week and just go through, you know, the 20 minutes of what's going on and what needs to happen. But we we regularly meet and talk about what's what's winning and what's losing. Mm-hmm. And and we can see that. And that's the other thing. A lot of times, you know, he knows we both have that pulse on the clients that is, has been really I mean, it's it's good to have that uh, opportunity to spend a little bit more time, really, because that defection thing, there's nothing like having that come out of left field. And sometimes it does come at renewal and sometimes it comes, you know, just out of left field, uh, just somebody we weren't expecting to lose. But. That's been, it's been great. It's been well, almost I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what else it does for their agency there. It gives a beacon of hope, uh, you know, a light, if you will, to other account managers to say, Hey, look, if you'll do a great job in this position and maybe Tracy moves up the chain of command, or we decide to hire somebody else, we'd certainly love to do that in-house rather than outside. So uh, to me, it, it kind of gives those account managers that maybe are that person on the other end of the producer an opportunity to, you know, become more knowledgeable, to gain experience. And then with, with the understanding that, hey, if you'll check all the boxes one day, you, you may be in the exact same role that Tracy's in one day. 
You know well, and I mean? Scott, you just answered your own question from earlier. What is it you could do with somebody who had the potential of, of really, you know, going next level? Yeah. A lot of times there's not a next level uh, when right. it comes to an account exec. And, you know, because they don't want to go straight to the sales and, and what else is out there. And, and that's, that's kind of an, an interesting conundrum. But I think that you've kind of answered your own question there, that that would no, be right. a great, a great opportunity for somebody who wanted to, to advance and was willing to put the time and effort into, to learning what was necessary to get them there. And luckily for me, I know you and I can have them come and spend a week with you and train with you and get, get right with the Lord on how to be a, Hey, you know, I'm just up the road, Scott. Executive client manager. (laughs) I ain't scared. I'll send them up there. I'll even pay you to do it. It didn't, it didn't bother me a bit. So last but not least, what are you doing? Cause I know you well enough. You're one of those people kind of like me, you're reading books, you're learning, you're growing. What, what are you doing right now to better yourself in terms of becoming better at your craft and what you're doing you taking any classes insurance classes or anything right now or just you know the ironic thing you may still be drinking from a fire hose it and that really felt like that and there's there's some of that where i mean just recently i worked on a a safety handbook from one of our clients that was the first time i'd ever had an opportunity to really to provide that kind of information that level of service to them and value add that value add. And you know, that's one of the things that I continually do. But Scott, honestly, the thing that's been the biggest gift for me and coming from where I had been, where I literally ate and slept and breathed my niche and as a producer is to come into this role. And it's truly a Monday through Friday, nine to five role. And there's now opportunity for me to do things outside of the of my day that's not completely centered on my career. Right. So this weekend I'm going on a mission trip. Where are we going? It's just four days, three nights, and it's not overseas, which those opportunities will be around the corner at some point in time. But if uh, if anybody's noticed what we're going to be seeing here uh, now, and we've already been seeing as a trend within our cities to see immigrants coming into our cities a lot of them from many different countries. But one of the things that we're seeing a real growth of is in Muslim communities. And I'm getting an opportunity this coming weekend to spend a few days shadowing a missionary that works in a community that is uh, become, I think it's literally the highest population of Muslims within an area. And in this particular area happens to be the highest number of Yemeni people outside of the country of Yemen. Mm. Now, that's not what we have necessarily in Chattanooga, but what I like the opportunity of is, and I'm just, you know, taking some vacation days in this particular case, just because I wanted to do this for myself. And that is to spend time learning about how you develop community Mm cross-culturally so that you can help people become acclimated into the United States in a way that they feel like, like they're a neighbor, that they actually become part of the community and I, I follow a little group called Women of Welcome. And, and, and it is based on faith, you know, as far as what, you know, what I'm being supported from. But it's not just the idea of, of going through to change people's minds. It's really more about changing people's hearts, about how they feel and how they feel accepted into the community. I, you know, I didn't grow up this way, even though I grew up with, you know, a, a great idea from the time I was in high school through college and so forth. It was very multi-ethnic, but it wasn't necessarily multicultural. Wow. And with that, I, I kind of lost a sense of, you know, I, I think I felt a little bit of indignation, you know, over the years. I was like, I kind of felt like some of these people who were like, I just don't know about these people. You know, this United States is changing so much. And I, I felt a little bit of that. But because of my faith and because of this opportunity, and, you know, I've really been kind of gearing up for it for the last few months, it's really something that I'm looking forward to, to be able to spend that kind of time really getting to know what other people's experience of being in the United States is coming from someplace else and what we can do to support them as a neighbor and as as welcoming them to community, because I just see that as part of the, the bigger picture, not only because of, you know, my heart of faith, but also just to want Chattanooga to be a welcoming place Uh, in this particular area, you know, just I'm getting the opportunity to go someplace else and see it in action. Uh, 
And I think that I can bring it back home. And it's something that I just want to do, you know, in my, if you want to say, quote unquote, spare time. And that's a development that I never had really time for when I was for all these years in insurance. I've, I've done a lot and spent a lot of time, extra time on committees and volunteering within the industry. Or when I was in agriculture, I spent a lot of times and weekends, you know, volunteering for the agriculture, sustainable agriculture project, Appalachian sustainable agriculture project. Can't talk. I loved that. And that was all very much tied to my career. And now I'm at a point where I can do something that's really just tied to the community. And if it ever comes back and comes full circle into my career, that's great. But if it doesn't, then I now have that time that I can at least set aside for things that also matter a lot to me personally and spiritually. So what I just heard was your new position has given you the freedom Freedom. to do things that you're passionate about. You know, you start going out into the world and learning more about other cultures. And I'll tell you this, it'll end up probably affecting you as much as it will them. And I had the fortune of traveling around the world and seeing a lot of different cultures. And usually when people start doing some of that, it, it actually, it changes them in a way that uh, they're just uh, a different, a little different after they do things like that. So I'm I'm super proud of you for getting a chance to do that. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited. Guys, as I end every podcast, rewards come from action, not discussion. Get your ass out from behind that desk today. Realize that we have a very, very, very short time on this earth. Be more like Tracy Cotton. Go try new things. Go do new things. Go experience new cultures. and you will come back and you'll be a better person for that. Hope that each and every one of you will do that. Go make money for your family, for your kids, for your wife, for your husband, for your parents that are struggling out there. Go make money for them today. Figure out what your why is and go out there and be the best you that you can possibly be. Write good business for the companies that you represent and write good business for the agencies that you represent. Tracy Cotton, I love you. Love you too, Scott. Thanks so much. Anything you need, I'm a phone call away. So hit me up on Messenger or give me a shout. I'll be happy to help. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and we love each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being a part of our family, and we'll see you back here real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at scott at iprotectinsurance.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to portalinsurance.com or email him at bradley at portalinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. We thank you so much for listening to our show and being a part of our family. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on the next episode of the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care.